and welcome. I'm Teku Lee, I'm chair of the Travers Department of Political Science here at Berkeley, and it is my genuine and heartfelt pleasure to welcome you all to uh, today's Baxter Liberty Initiative second event. Uh, this is an important new program in the department created by the generous and visionary support of Ambassador Frank Baxter, who is with, here, uh, with us here today with his wife. And um, as is the case uh, with many departments uh, here at Berkeley, the Traverse Department enjoys a uh, very cherished reputation as one of the finest places anywhere uh, to study and research politics and government. From the telling insights of bargaining games into our understanding of international conflict, to the role of uh, critical junctures and path dependencies on explaining policy change and political regime change, to fresh effervescent uh, readings and renditions of Thomas Hobbes and the concept of tolerance itself. Many of the most impactful ideas about politics and political science have their home right here uh, at Berkeley. <laughs> Berkeley political science has also been the first intellectual home to generations of undergraduates and graduate students many of whom are now uh, eminent scholars, dedicated public servants, and leaders in their communities. And with this kind of success, it is uh, perhaps no surprise that um, the ranks of political science majors continues to grow here on this campus. And for the last couple of years, I think we've been the largest uh, major in the college. Importantly, one of the most fundamental precepts on which our success has been built is the free and critical exchange of ideas. We are dedicated as our core mission to the enterprise of bettering citizenship and our common prosperity through free and critical exchange of ideas. And this, of course, I think is the precept that's also at the heart of the Baxter Liberty Initiative. And for this reason, I, I could not be more thrilled that the department is now able to host this new program, and I'm very excited uh, to see the interesting and impactful ways in which it will open up dialogue uh, all over campus. Without further ado, let me now turn to my main task at hand, which is to introduce a dear friend uh, and esteemed colleague, Professor Jack Citrin. Uh, Jack, in many ways, ideally embodies uh, this commitment to free and critical exchange of ideas that I speak of. He is a an iconoclast in the best, most propitious sense of the term. Careful and judicious about what he believes and tenacious and principled in his advocacy of those beliefs. He is the Heller Professor of Political Science and Director of the Institute of Governmental Studies. Jack's golden bear roots run very deep. He is a Berkeley PhD in political science and has been on our faculty for, I think, more than four decades. And during this period, he has written some of the most compelling work done by a political scientist across a broad range of issues, which include trust in government, the initiative process in California, the politics of language and immigration, and the future of national identities in the United States and Europe. Jack has something of a uh, magnum opus that will come out next year with Cambridge University Press titled American Identity and the Politics of Multiculturalism. It promises, based on my having seen versions of this, uh, to be a bracing read, so get your wallets ready. Um, most importantly for the present moment, Jack has led together with his faculty committee the creative team that has shaped this Baxter Liberty uh, Initiative program at Berkeley, and he will lead us through this afternoon's program. So on that note, please give a warm welcome to Professor Jackson. Thank you, Teku. I'm glad my wife is here to hear the judicious choice of word iconoclast. Uh, I don't know what. Uh, anyway, it's been a great pleasure for me to be a part of this uh, process that has created the Baxter Liberty Initiative. I want to not only recognize, as Teku did, Ambassador Baxter and his wife Kathy, but also Dean Carla Hessa, who really has been the spearhead of putting together this program and who has been a strong advocate of it and supporter of it. 
I also see in the audience not only uh, Professor Hoekstra, who's going to speak later, but also Professor Cooter and Professor Hollinger, who are with me, the committee that, in some sense, administers and sort of tries to uh, uh, make this program a success. Let me say a few words about Frank Baxter and then have him come up and say a few words before I introduce Dr. Brooks and, and my colleague, Kinch Hoekstra. Uh, Frank Baxter is a native of Northern California, and he graduated from Berkeley with a BA degree in economics and honors in 1961. Before college, he had, been, he had served in the Air Force for four years. And from 1974 until 2002, he was employed by Jefferies & Company, a global investment bank. In 1987, he became CEO of the company. He retired in 2001 and now serves as chairman emeritus of that firm. From 2006 to 2009, he was ambassador to the Oriental Republic of Uruguay, an experience that I know from speaking to Kathy and Frank they enjoyed greatly. Uh, his civic activities are many and varied. He's committed to youth, especially to education and to the arts, and devotes time and energy on many boards. He also has golden bear roots. Uh, yeah, last night he wore the tie. Tonight I'm wearing that same tie. And he's been a trustee of the University of California Berkeley Foundation and currently is vice chairman of the board and chair of the executive committee. So, Frank, if you would please come up and give treat us to a few words. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, it's been wonderful to be with Jack because he was a classmate of my wife a few years ago in high school in Japan. So it's just a coincidence that we have these roles, but it's a wonderful coincidence. And I think that Berkeley must be very, very exceptional. The, the Academy, Contemporary Academy has a reputation for being in favor of all kinds of diversity except for the diversity of ideas. But the, uh, in our campus uh, today, we have Van Jones and Arthur Brooks. Uh, we're hosting uh, both of those, uh, uh, both of those folks. So uh, we still have a sense of the diversity of ideas, I th and I think that we should be really proud of ourselves. I uh, have come to feel that uh, most of my life is a, s a series of random events, which I make up the narrative afterwards. And and one random event was that after going through uh, two colleges and being in the Air Force, I wound up in Berkeley, and that was a a, a great milestone in my life where I l learned to meet. Uh, many great scholars, uh, uh, heard, heard great ideas, made uh, lasting friends, found multitude of causes to, to, uh, to uh, work on. And most of all, the, uh, I think most of all, is the credential of having graduated from the University of California. Although I had very little economic value after I graduated, I had, I had optionality and I was attractive to employers and, and uh, uh, had uh, and it's, it's made a big, big difference, both the, both the relationships that I've made and being involved with the university over the years. And of course, the biggest random event in my life was being born, and being born, although in a very, very humble family, very poor, but one of six, for, oh, eldest of six kids, I was born against all odds in this country and in this state, and although I was different. I was poorer than most of the kids. I, I grew up in a different religion than, than, than most of the kids. I wasn't a star athlete in a place where being a star athlete was one of the most important things. But I had a feeling, based on this state and this country, that anything was possible. Um, and although I felt different in many ways, I had no doubt that I had a chance to succeed in some way. And I, now I today work with kids that are as poor or poorer than I do a good part of my time, and uh, those kids do not have that feeling. Most of them don't have that feeling, and they're right. They've been, been deprived of the tools uh, to succeed in education based on um, special interests that have a, a higher priority for their own jobs than they do for educating the kids, and, and it goes on and it goes on and on, and over the years, I see how lucky I've been to have been born here and see that, I, that that was a result of some inspired thinking by imperfect people uh, that, that I, was, had, I had certain rights. Uh, uh, 
I had the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that, that I could exercise those rights. And I became very much more and more in love with the idea of liberty and the importance of liberty. And, and I see uh, the children today feel that liberty is not possible for them and, the, and that, they need, that they need to be helped. And so I wanted to share with uh, my fellow bears, the younger bears who will inherit this world, whether they like it or not, and to share some of the ideas of people who have embraced the ideas of, of Jefferson and Madison and before, before them Locke and, and, and Smith, and just to present to, uh, to uh, the younger people a possible, an another way of looking at the world. And I think Arthur Brooks is especially a good example of that because he came from a tradition that was uh, very similar to the prevailing tradition in the academy and over experience and based on data, he has a, a, a view that embraces liberty. So I'm very anxious to, to uh, share, have him share his thoughts with you and, and get your reaction to those. So thank you very, very much. Well, well, let me now introduce the speakers and explain uh, the process. Uh, Dr. Brooks will speak, lecture, uh, give a lecture, which she says will be approximately 40 minutes. Then Professor Hoekstra, who will respond, 10 minutes. And then uh, Dr. Brooks, if he wishes, can again say a few words. But then we want to devote a good deal of time for questions, question answer period. And I think people have been handed out cards to write their questions on. I will then collect these cards and read the questions. And uh, Dr. Brooks and Professor Hoekstra will be sitting up here and will respond as, as they wish. OK? So let me give a more formal introduction to Dr. Arthur Brooks, who's been the president of the American Enterprise Institute in Washington since January 1, 2009. Previously, he was the Lewis A. Battle, Bantle, excuse me, Professor of Business and Government Policy at Syracuse University at the Maxwell School. He's the author of 10 books and hundreds of articles on topics ranging from economics to the arts to military operations research. His most recent book is the New York Times bestseller, The Road to Freedom, How to Win the Fight for Free Enterprise, published by Basic Books. Other books include The Battle, Gross National Happiness, Social Entrepreneurship, and Who Really Cares? And this is a somewhat, I think, unique aspect of any speaker who I've heard here at the university uh, background. Uh, before pursuing work in public policy, Dr. Brooks spent 12 years as a professional French hornist with the City Orchestra of Barcelona and other ensembles. And then he switched gears, switched music, and became a distinguished student of public policy. And let me also then briefly introduce uh, Professor Kinch Hoekstra, my colleague in political science, but who is the Chancellor's Professor of Political Science and Law. Professor Hoekstra specializes in the history of political, moral, and legal thought with an emphasis on the ancient Greeks and on early modern Europe. Before coming to Berkeley, he was for over a decade on the Faculty of Philosophy at Oxford University, where he was fellow and tutor in philosophy and classics at Balliol College. And his new book, called Thomas Hobbes and the Creation of Order, is about to be published by Oxford University Press. And if you're going to choose one of those two books, our books to spend your money on, choose his. <laughs> Arthur? Thank you, Jack. Uh, thank you for that gracious introduction. Thank you to all of you for spending a little bit of your time uh, here with me tonight. It's an honor for me to be here at Berkeley. Uh, this is my first uh, appearance here at Berkeley. Um, although I've been in the Bay Area many times speaking about similar topics, it's, uh, it's especially good to be here at this really distinguished place. Uh, special thanks to Frank Baxter. Uh, Frank and I have been friends for a number of years, and I've been an admirer of his work. And the fact that he's dedicated a good part of his career and his resources to the, to the ideas of liberty. Um, the ideas themselves are really the currency that we deal with in, in the world of think tanks in the academy. I was delighted to hear 
about the, the, uh, the dedication to ideas per se of this department. Uh, my own institution, the American Enterprise Institute, was founded with this motto, that the competition of ideas is fundamental to a free society. Obviously, that's as true here as it is at AEI, and I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. I'm also uh, very pleased that I get to share the stage with Ken Schokstra, and I'm looking forward to his remarks. Um, I've been the president of AEI, American Enterprise Institute, think tank in Washington, dedicated to the promotion of the ideas of free enterprise for the past four years. <clears throat> and I want to talk to you about free enterprise in the public policy process in America. Um, and basically, I want to tell you not what you might be expecting. I want to tell you that I believe that the free enterprise agenda is losing. And I want to tell you why I think it's losing. And in a nutshell, it's losing because of people like me. And I want to tell you more about what I mean. Um, in essence, we have not been good about communicating what's written on our hearts about a free society. And our inability to make the moral case for free enterprise has led us on a path that endangers the very idea of a free society. Now, to make the point about how important it is to be able to connect with human beings about the essential key importance, moral importance, of what we're talking about, I want to illustrate with the, the story of, uh, of three friends. Uh, these three friends play golf every Saturday morning. It's the highlight of their week. One is a psychologist, one is a priest, and one, like me, is a free market economist. Now, they're going out on a Saturday morning, one beautiful day in October. It's gorgeous, 8 o'clock in the morning, and they can't wait to get out. And as soon as they get out on the golf course, the first thing that, they, that happens is they get stuck behind the slowest twosome that they've ever seen. Now, this is, if you've ever played golf, which some of you may have, I'm not a golfer, well, at least not a good golfer, um, but I tell you, it's terrible when you're behind a, a slow twosome, and, and this was the slowest one ever. These guys were taking four shots to get it into the cup. It took them five minutes to select the club, even though they had a caddy, so it should have been going faster. Now, they went three holes like this, and it was unbearable, until they started to make remarks just loud enough to hear. The psychologist, he said, I sure hope I never get stuck behind a twosome this slow ever again, but nothing. A couple more holes go by, and finally, they've, they're fed up. They march up to the caddy and they say, this just isn't right. You see how slow this is? You've got to let us play through. The caddy says, sure, you can play through. That's fine, but do you realize how rude you've been? Do you know who these guys are? The three friends say, no. I say, well, do you remember last year when the town orphanage burned down? Yeah. Do you remember the two firefighters who pulled all the orphans out of the blaze, but in the process they lost their sight? No, the, 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 the three friends say, no, you're kidding me. It's not... And the caddy says, yeah, it's the heroes, the firefighters. Golf is their hobby. Obviously, it goes a little slowly, so maybe a little respect. Now, the three friends are mortified, <laughs> the, the, as, as any of us would be. The psychologist, he says, you know, I think I've learned an important lesson here. I've dedicated my life to helping people, especially vulnerable people. And now I do this. I'm going to learn from this and be a better professional psychologist, and I'm grateful for that. The priest says, that's true. This is an important event. I have a contrite heart. I thank the Lord for that. The free market economist, he thinks about it for a second, and he says, you know, it would be more economically efficient if they played at night. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so now I want to tell you how I did that same thing, but in real life and how I came to an epiphany that's completely changed my approach to how I talk about free enterprise, and I hope will rectify my past failures to get the point across about the system that I think is important for America and important for the world. Uh, when I came to AEI four years ago, uh, many people were talking about the fact that the free enterprise system was waning and in real danger in America and indeed around the world. And I was scratching my head. I was puzzling about what we were doing wrong. I mean, AEI has been around since 1938, <clears throat> fighting for the ideas of a free society. Why aren't we winning more battles? <clears throat> and so I was puzzling over this and puzzling over it. And, and I finally had an epiphany. An epiphany came when I went home to visit my family for Thanksgiving. Now, to give you a little bit more background, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, in a group of progressive Democrats. 
artists and academics. Okay? So Thanksgiving for me is super fun, as you can imagine. <laughs> and um, so th about three years ago, I was ha sitting around the Thanksgiving table, and I was there with my wife. And my wife is more uh, interested in free enterprise even than I am. She's an immigrant. She's here because America is a country where she could do exactly what she feels. She grew up in a country that didn't have free enterprise and didn't have capitalism. And she really appreciates this country in just the same kind of touching way that Frank talked about it from his background as a kid. And, and we were having dinner, and I was sort of, sort of through clenched teeth. We are having the same sort of conversations as we typically have um, around the table. And this was after the financial crisis. And so the conversation was, as it always is, the problem with the American economy, which is capitalists. It's people who have their foot on the neck of the poor. And if only they would pay their fair share, and if only we could regulate the economy appropriately, we could have avoided this crisis and we can avoid future crises. And then they said, because we love each other, they said to me, so what do you think? And, <laughs> and, and I said, well, and you know, they all knew what I was going to say. And I said, look, you guys, the problem is not too much free enterprise. The problem is not enough free enterprise. We had a financial crisis in this country because of the malfeasance and greed in government agencies that spread to the malfeasance and greed and cronyism on Wall Street that had nothing to do with entrepreneurs putting their own capital at risk. It had to do with the worst aspects of people who are gaming the system. What we need is real free enterprise to lower the barriers to entrepreneurs, to lower the regulatory barriers and the tax barriers. And then I had this killer statistic that I threw in there because I'm the head of AEI, so I'm smart. And I said, did you know that the United States today has the highest corporate tax rates in all the OECD countries, and nobody said a word. Nobody cared. And my sister-in-law, she said, you know, I think that you just want to give tax breaks to your friends, those billionaires, who are the donors to your fancy think tank. And you know what else? I just read an article in the Seattle Times about a little girl who lives with her mother in a car. What is your precious free enterprise system going to do for her? And I lost the argument. Right then and there, I lost. And no, not only that, they thought I was kind of a jerk. <clears throat> that, you know, he was such a nice kid, but then he grew up and became an economist. And, you know, that. <clears throat> and, and later, I was complaining about it to my wife. And I thought I would have a sympathetic audience. And I said, I, you know, I just don't understand these people. These people are my family, right? <clears throat> I said, I just don't understand these people. And I got all the facts, I got all the data, and then they just walk off with, and they don't want to hear. They don't want to hear my arguments. They don't want to hear the facts. All they have are platitudes and anecdotes, and, and they think that that's somehow better than the data. And my wife said, you know, you think you're so smart. You run that think tank, and you think you're so smart, but I sometimes wonder. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and she said, <clears throat> you know, she was talking about a little girl who lives with her mother in a car. And you were talking about OECD tax rates. What do you think is going to win? And I said, well, I know. So you know, I could be a little bit more touching. I said, touching? What do you care about more, people or money? I said, well, people. She said, why don't you talk about people? Why don't you start talking about people? If you think the free enterprise system is so important, talk about how that helps people. And maybe you'll start to win. And she was right. I was failing to make the moral case. Look, I have it written on my heart that a free society is the best for people. But I can't prove it unless I talk about how it affects people. And that's what I want to talk about here tonight. I want to talk about how to make the moral case, how I've evolved in my thinking and in my writing that I think can help us to explain to those who are less persuaded and help them understand that we're on the same side of the table about wanting what is best for all people, including the poor. Now, to start on this argument, I want to introduce a paradox to you. And so it's a paradox about government in America today. <clears throat> and it looks something like this. If you ask Americans, do you believe that the free enterprise system is the best system for America despite severe ups and downs and bad recessions? Ask it just like that, you'll find that 70% of Americans consistently say yes, 70%. If you ask Americans, what do you think about the government today? They will tell you, about 70%, same percentage, will tell you that the government is too big and trying to do too much. Now, for a guy like me, that's fantastic. I mean, we're going to win everything. Every election, only free enterprise candidates should be electable, and a thousand flowers should bloom, right? But here's the paradox. That's not the way people actually vote, and that's not what they apparently really prefer. 
when it comes to actual decisions. My institution was founded in 1938, and it was founded in rebellion against one single shocking fact, that the government at all levels, state, local, and federal, as a percentage of GDP, was occupying 15%. It was taking 15% of what Americans earned, and it was spending it through the government. It was forcibly, coercively taxing it away and spending it. That's what stimulated the creation of my institute. The founders came out of the business world and said, that's got to stop because that's not a free society. Right? They said, we have an administration in Washington in 1938 that's trying to use the Great Depression as a pretext to turn the United States away from free enterprise and toward European-style social democracy. Perhaps that sounds familiar to some of you. OK, now, let's go forward to today. OK, so 1938, because of this terrible crisis, 15%, really shocking. Today, it's 36% of America's GDP is taxed away and spent by some level of government. If you ask the Congressional Budget Office, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, what it's going to look like going forward, they will show you that in the year 2038, it will be 50% of American GDP. Americans will work from January 1st through June 30th to pay for a government that 81% of Americans say they don't like and don't trust. It's a problem here. It doesn't matter what your politics are. There's a problem here. There's a, an inconsistency, there's a paradox that we have to solve. So what's the solution? What's the answer? What explains this paradox? And there are basically three explanations out there. There's a liberal explanation, a conservative explanation, and a correct explanation. So I'm going to give you what all three. The liberal explanation is typically we don't really like free enterprise. We say we do but we really don't. What we really like is big government and a cradle-to-grave welfare state. So we talk about free enterprise in kind of a sentimental way, the way we talk about old episodes of I Love Lucy. Great stuff. It's actually not that funny, it turns out. And, and free enterprise isn't actually that great. We really want the modern social democracy that we have today. Conservatives say, no, 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 that's wrong. The problem is we've never explained the data adequately about how free enterprise makes us rich. We've never talked about the fact that if you want good GDP growth and you want a low uh, uh, unemployment rate and you want low interest rates and you want people to be able to prosper a lot, you got to have the free enterprise system. And the way that you're going to do that is with really great PowerPoint charts and a whole lot of data and you shove it down the gullet of Americans. And if you do that with sufficient force, suddenly sometime the light bulb will go off, ding, and people will say, free enterprise, yeah, that's really what we need. Okay, now, that's wrong. That approach is all wrong. How do I know that? That's what I spent a good part of my adult life trying to do. And I know it doesn't work. I have all the data you need. Free enterprise makes the richest countries in the history of the world. Everybody understands that. Everybody agrees with that. That's a settled issue. That doesn't make it a good system. And that gets to the real explanation for the paradox, which is the insufficiency of the moral argument for free markets, free societies, and free enterprise. So to make that, I need to talk a little bit about morality. Now, when somebody gets up and says, I'm going to talk about morality, usually it's sort of scary experience. Because um, you think I'm going to start talking about God, guns, gays, and abortions. I'm not. I'm going to talk about generally how moral decisions get made, how moral judgments get made. And then I'm going to talk about how it pertains to how we think about the economy. Now, there's a lot of research these days about moral judgments. Uh, part of it is done by uh, neuroscientists who do work on the brain. And it's very interesting to understand how moral judgments are processed by the brain. It turns out that your moral decision making happens in a part of your brain called the medial prefrontal cortex. Now, I'm not a neuroscientist, and probably most of you aren't either. That's the part of your brain right behind your forehead. This is a, this is a good prominent example of a medial prefrontal cortex you see before you're here today. Yeah. Um, and if, if the, the medial prefrontal cortex, it turns out, is the most quintessentially modern and human part of the brain. It is all the stuff that really distinguishes us, distinguishes us as modern human beings from lesser animals. Everything you do from your executive decision making to your, your material judgments to your moral judgments happens in your medial prefrontal cortex. You're driving to work. You encounter traffic. You make a split second decision to go left or go right. That's executive judgment, and that's your medial prefrontal cortex lit up. You get to work. Your colleague says, do you like my tie? You make a moral judgment. Do I lie so that he doesn't feel bad, or I tell him the truth? 
These are the kinds of moral judgments, little moral judgments we make all day long, and they're happening in the same circuitry of the brain. It's very interesting. But here's the question. If you're presented with a moral question and a material question simultaneously, what's going to dominate that circuitry? What's your brain going to work on if you're confronted with both at the same time? You know I'm asking this because at Thanksgiving dinner, I was confronting the people at the table with a material claim at the same time that somebody from my family was confronting them with a moral claim. So who was getting the circuitry? Who got the real estate inside the heads of the people around the table? Now, it doesn't matter how compelling each argument was. It turns out we know the answer automatically. And we know the answer is the moral argument. Morality beats materialism, period, every time. How do we know that? We know that from researchers who study moral judgments in laboratory experiments using human subjects. So I have this friend. His name is Jonathan Haidt. And he wrote a really important book this spring. Some of you may have heard of it because it was a big bestseller. It was called, it was called the, uh, Why Good People Disagree on Politics and Religion, uh, uh, the, the Righteous Mind. The Righteous Mind. Okay, And he talked about moral decision making and moral judgments inside the brain. Now, I've known John Haidt for a bunch of years because we wrote about happiness with, under, with the same publisher at the same time. And that's, I, we were on panels together, and so I've been following his research, and he's been following mine for a long time. And, and at one point, we were talking about this, uh, that we're profoundly moral beings. And I said, I, got, I need, some, I need some, uh, some convincing on this one. As an economist, I kind of think that fundamentally, I'm actually a rational person more than a moral person. And he said, no, you're not. No, you're not. And I said, what do you mean? He says, nobody is. Everybody's moral first. And I said, you got to prove that. He says, fine. And he showed me an experiment that he does with human subjects in the laboratory to show them that they're moral first, second, and third, and rational only later. He showed me an experiment that basically occupied my medial prefrontal cortex. It gave me a moral judgment that I could not concentrate, that was so strong I couldn't concentrate on anything else, and I'm going to do it to you now. And I'm so sure that this is going to, I'm about to occupy your medial prefrontal cortex that I'm going, to, I'm going to give you this promise. If you don't remember anything else I say tonight, a year from now, you're going to remember the story I'm about to tell you, and most of you will repeat it to somebody before 24 hours is up. Okay, now, how do I know that? Because I've told the story before, and because Jonathan Haidt told the story to me. And so here it goes. And if you find it a little bit weird or shocking, remember, it's not my fault. So um, it goes something like this. This is a story about a family. And, and to give you a little bit more background, the family's just like mine. So my wife, Esther, and I have three children. Our daughter's nine, and our sons are 12 and 14. And the family in this story, just like mine, is always having some sort of conflict, sort of coalitions warring against each other. Right? In the case of this story, the family is in a big conflict about whether or not to get a dog. Okay? The kids really want a dog, and mom and dad are implacably hostile to the whole idea. So the kids say, it's not fair that we can't get a dog. You know, the, 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 the Shrivers next door, they have a dog. All the people up and down the street, they have a dog. How come we can't get a dog? And dad says, you want to know why we can't get a dog? I'll tell you why we can't get a dog. Because you kids are too irresponsible. If we get a dog, you know who's going to feed it? You know who's going to walk it? You know who's going to clean up after it? Me. So until you kids learn some responsibility, no dog. And he's just completely sure that this is the way this is going to turn out right now. It doesn't turn out that way because it turns out the way all of these conflicts turn out. The kids win over mom, and then there's a coalition against dad, and then dad caves in. Okay? And so they go down to the pound. Right? Now, Dad's really mad. He's in the car. So he says, it's always the same with you people. Right? They get down to the pound, and they pick out a puppy, and they name her Muffin, and they bring her home. Turns out Muffin's a great dog. It turns out Dad was completely wrong. Muffin brings the family together like nothing really ever has. Muffin's in all the Christmas pictures. Uh, everybody, the, she, she doesn't bite the mailman. She's great with the kids. Fantastic. They kind of laugh that dad didn't want to get her. And they go on for a couple of years like this. Best decision they probably ever made as a family, actually, was getting great old Muffin. You know, who you know who loves Muffin the most? Dad. And the reason is because when he gets home from work, nobody else is happy to see him. <laughs> <laughs> but enough about my autobiography. This is uh, <laughs> the, the, a couple of years go by, and 
One August afternoon, it's a beautiful day, um, the youngest child, she's 11 now, she accidentally leaves the front door open. Muffin sees a squirrel out in the front yard and goes running out after the squirrel into the road, boom, hit by a car and killed right in front of the whole family. I mean, all five of them see this. The kids are screaming. Mom is crying. Dad is choked up because he loved Muffin the most. And the kids say, Dad, what do we do? Dad goes out and picks up Muffin's lifeless body and brings her into the house. And together as a family, out of love, they decide that the right thing to do is to cook her and eat her. That's your medial prefrontal cortex at work. Now, <clears throat> you're processing a series of cognitions like that ending was all wrong. There's something wrong with tonight's speaker, for example. Uh, that's a terrible story. Uh, why would it end like that? And that's because you're experiencing a moral sentiment, very common, called repugnance. Now, Jonathan Hyde did this to me. I said, why did you tell me that? He says, because you told me that you are actually purely rational, and now I'm going to ask you a question. What's wrong with eating muffin? And I said, i got to tell you what's wrong with eating the dog? And he says, yeah, tell me what's wrong. And I said, I don't need to tell you why. He says, that's because you've processed it morally, and you've made a moral judgment, and you're not actually applying a material or executive decision on the basis of this. So I could actually now confront you with a bunch of arguments. Like, you know, hey, look, I know that's, it seems kind of terrible, but the muffin's a very high-quality protein source. Or um, it's actually OK to eat dogs in certain places around the world. Or it's their dog. I mean, I could come up with all of these kind of materialistic, free market economist kind of explanations. And you'd still be, are you kidding me? You're just getting weirder and weirder, man. This is, it's not OK to eat your pets. I don't have to give you any explanation for it. So that brings me back to Thanksgiving. I mean, not the eating the dog part, sorry. Um, uh, I was trying to confront a picture, a moral judgment, about a little girl who lives with her mother in a car. And I was trying to actually get people to stop making the moral judgment about this terrible scene by asking them to consider tax rates. It's not going to work. It's simply not going to work. The only thing that will work is if, by any chance, I have a compelling argument about morally why the free enterprise system will help her and will help all people. So what's that argument? What do we say? And to start to construct that argument, we need to turn back to the words that Frank brought up in his introduction tonight. It's the words of the American founders. You, most of you know uh, the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence by heart, that we're endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's a moral covenant. That's not a material claim. They could have talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of great riches and wealth. As a matter of fact, there's some evidence that the original construction of the document promised life, liberty, and the possession of property, which is the construction in the founding documents of the states of Virginia and Pennsylvania. But they didn't. Why not? Nobody knows. But it's certainly the case that the pursuit of happiness is more morally evocative to elicit struggle, maybe even death, for something that was nothing more than an idea of a free society. Now, we have all the data that it makes us rich. Nobody had the data back then. We had to actually ask people to fight for something that was a relatively utopian idea. Our founders understood that a moral claim was the only way that they could get that done. The pursuit of happiness. But what does it mean? I mean, it sounds great, but if we can't translate it into something, we can't just you know, tell the little girl in the car, go pursue your happiness. I mean, it's just meaningless. We have to figure out what that means. And actually, how does it bear on our economy? And I puzzled over that for a long time. As a matter of fact, I thought about that one so hard that for a, at, a, at a certain point, I decided to write a book. What is the pursuit of happiness? And how, we, how do we understand that as economists? I wrote a book called Gross National Happiness uh, when I was still a professor at Syracuse. The, the great thing about being a, a full professor with an endowed chair is that you have no adult supervision. And, and so I was able to write a book about anything I wanted. It occurred to me that I wanted to write a book about the pursuit of happiness, and so I did. And I, I answered that question to my satisfaction. I did work for uh, two years looking at who's happy and who's not. And I can tell you a lot, and we can do it in the Q&A if you want. I can tell you who's happier, men or women. 
I can tell you who's happier, religious or non-religious people. I can tell you who's happier, Republicans or Democrats. I know the answers to all those questions. But I want to tell you, in the context of the pursuit of happiness, the single most interesting fact that I learned when I was writing a book about happiness. And it's going to sound a little strange, but you'll figure out what I'm talking about here in a second. It's the answer to the question, what is the average unhappiest age in a man's life? Okay, now, we know, looking at the data, that there's an average unhappiest age in a man's life. And it's been very consistent for a long time. And I've seen papers on it. And I've actually gotten the data and recreated the data analysis using the best empirical tools. And I believe and know it to be true. There's an identifiable age because of a phenomenon in the lives of about half of men. So what is the average unhappiest age in a man's life? What do you think? Throw out an age. What do you think it would be? Think about your own lives. Think about your parents. Yeah. Kinch. 40s. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So yeah, 40s, 45 to be specific. Now, it's different for everybody, obviously. We're talking about you know, large numbers here. But the av on average, the unhappiest age in a man's life is 45. And it's, it's actually quite clear in the data. So I started asking my friends who were social psychologists and professionals in the field, what's the deal? You know, what's the, what explains this? And you know, some will say that there's some hormonal changes in a man's life. Most of them will talk about family issues, right? That's the age when your wife figures out definitively that you're boring. Right, 45. That's uh, when you have a teenager at home. It's really dramatic and terrible, that kind of thing. Those are all wrong. I'm an economist, and I've got the real answer. So I'm going to let you in on it. So first of all, how many guys in here are under 45? You're on your way down. <laughs> so, um, so what's going on at age 45? And the answer is this, according to the data. About half of guys get to age 45, according to survey data, and they experience a very funny phenomenon. And it looks something like this. Now, I say men, and I'm not including women. Why? Because women are happier than men all throughout their lives in the United States and other countries. And they're less prone to fluctuations across the years. Interesting. It's, I don't like it, but it's true. Okay? That's what the data tells us to be true. So what's going on around age 45? And life for men in their 20s and 30s basically in a nutshell. I mean, I'm not going to give you all the ins and outs of the data because that's boring. But that basically, life is like being on a superhighway. You want to succeed, you want to be happy, hit the gas. You want to succeed more, hit the gas harder. Just go forward. Dollar signs, success, it's all one direction. Around age 45, about half of men basically wake up and say, I think I missed my exit. <laughs> somewhere, along the, somewhere along the way, there was a little road that was unmarked, and I wanted that road because there was something off that exit down that little road, and I don't know what it is, but I know I'm in the wrong place right now. But I can't turn around. So what is it for half the guys? Now, I turned out to be in the other half. I got really super lucky. So you just heard Jack told you that I, I used to be a French horn player. I, was, uh, I dropped out of college when I was 19, and I went on the road playing music, and I ended up in the Barcelona Symphony for a long time. I didn't go to college until I was 29. It was a, it was a, a gap decade, right? So, um, <clears throat> and when I was 29, and I was in the orchestra, I decided I wanted to quit. So I called my dad. And I said, Dad, I got big news. I'm going to leave music. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, I'm going to leave music. I have big ideas. I want to go to college, and I want to study, I don't know, poetry and math and statistics and economics or something. I want to study. I want to improve my brain. And, and maybe I'll be a college professor. And I, I didn't get the reaction that I thought. He wasn't thrilled at all. He said, you can't do that. You're at the top of your game. You're making a living. You started a family. You can't just walk away. Why? And I had the answer ready. I said, because I'm not happy. And there's silence on the phone. And he comes back and he says, so what makes you so special? <laughs> 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 but it was the right thing to do, because I really am happy now. I really have found the little road. It was the little road I was looking for. But about half of guys don't get it. So here's the real question, sort of interesting about guys who are 45. But here's the real question. What is down that little road? What is it that they're looking for? And we have the data for that, too. I'm not a theologian or a philosopher, but as an economist, I've got the data. And what do they say? The answer is this. What are you looking for? You're looking for earned success. Now, what's that? It's not money. It's not money. It sounds like money, but it's not money. Earned success 
is the belief that you're creating value with your life and value in the lives of other people, no matter how you define it. I've done work with social entrepreneurs my whole career. I taught a class at Syracuse and wrote a textbook, a graduate business textbook called Social Entrepreneurship, which I don't recommend. And I worked with hundreds of social entrepreneurs. These are guys who were living on tap water and ramen noodles. But they were happy because they were earning their success. Their profit was not derived in dollars. It was derived in kids learning to read or the environment being cleaned up or souls saved or something. I've also worked with commercial entrepreneurs who made a lot of money. And it's the same phenomenon. Interesting thing. Entrepreneurs, on average in America, earn 20% less annual income than the average government bureaucrat. Most people don't know that, but it's true. And entrepreneurs are the happiest professionals, whereas people in the government are near the bottom. The question is, what's going on? And the answer is earned success. Doesn't matter how much you make. If you believe you're creating value with your life and creating value in the lives of other people, the data show you will be the happiest person you know. I have data from the General Social Survey collected by the University of Chicago, nonpartisan, best gold standard source of social, data, uh, social database that we have. They show that if you take two people who are precisely the same, same age, same sex, same religion, same region of residence, same level of education, everything, and they both believe that they have earned their success, but one earns eight times as much money as the second, they'll be equally likely to say they're very happy about their lives. Materialism with money is a tyranny. It's a false alley. It's the wrong direction. We need to earn our success by defining the currency of that success and then acquiring it systematically in a way that creates value in our lives and value in the lives of other people. Now, earned success has an opposite, and that's something called learned helplessness. I didn't make that up. Martin Seligman, the most eminent social psychologist currently doing work on the subject of happiness, he teaches at Penn. Uh, invented the term learned helplessness based on his experiments with human subjects. He found that when you work with human subjects and you take away the rewards of their hard work, or you give them rewards that they didn't earn, they learn helplessness, which is to say they become de passive, they become depressed, and they give up. And it doesn't matter if you take something away that they earned or you give them something they didn't earn, the same phenomenon occurs, and it is this thing that he finds truly debilitating called learned helplessness. So now, let's think a little bit about what we need to earn our success, and a little bit about what we need to avoid learning helplessness. And there are a lot of things that we need, but one of those things is a system. We need a system where we can match our skills and our passions, where we get to keep the rewards of our virtuous activity, where being an entrepreneur is something that's celebrated. There's only one system that does that. That's the free enterprise system. I'll talk more about that here in a second, but that's the beginning of the reason that I'm completely convinced that the free enterprise system is not an economic alternative, but a moral imperative for the dignity of every person. And to the extent that certain people, particularly those who are poor today, feel that they're foreclosed from the system of free enterprise, we strip them of their dignity and we make them less human, and that's not moral. And we have to solve that problem. Now, when I'm talking to people about this, it doesn't matter what their politics are, their, their views on free enterprise exactly. They'll say, yeah, earned success is great. Sounds perfect. And learned helplessness sounds terrible. We all know that. But you know, I think it's more complicated than that, because we all can't earn our success. Look, everybody's born different in different circumstances, and people are victims of all sorts of different circumstances in their lives. So that's not fair. Right? And especially, it's not fair to poor people. I think that free enterprise is good for rich people, but bad for poor people, and that's not fair. Now, why do I need to address those issues? Because I haven't come anywhere close to telling my sister-in-law what I propose to do about that little girl who lives in the car with her mother. Huh. I know what she should do. She should start a small business. That's absurd, right? And that's the kind of advice that we get about poverty in this country. It's not helpful. It's not right. What do I have to say about poverty? What do I have to say about fairness? Let's start with fairness. You know, you can't turn on any political debate today without hearing politicians talk about fairness. You know, the presidential debates were filled with it. The President of the United States, he talks about the need for millionaires and billionaires to pay their fair share. What does fairness mean? 
Economists have asked this question again and again. And perhaps it sounds completely obvious, and economists would ask it and answer it because they want to get tenure. Um, fair enough. But actually, some of the research has been quite telling. And I want to tell you about just a little bit of it. But a little bit of academic research. I want to pull back the curtain on what we economists do in the darkness of our offices uh, that actually explains some of the moral workings of our lives. Economists, starting about 20 years ago, to try to get behind the meaning of fairness, they set up a kind of a game using human subjects called an ultimatum game. And here's how it works. A researcher ushers you into a room and gives you $10. You sit down at a table, and he or she brings in another person you don't know who's the other participant in the experiment who sits across the table from you. And you get this instruction. You have to decide how much of your $10 to offer to the other person. If the other person accepts your offer, you walk out with those two amounts of money. And you go home with it. You get to keep it. But if that other person turns down your offer, you both walk out with zero. Now, if you think about it, you'd say, if you're homo economicus, if you're an economic man, you'd say, look, if I offer one cent to the other person, and I'm going to take $9.99, the person's going to take it, it's because it's better than nothing. But you and I all know that economists are wrong in that prediction that the person's going to turn you down. Why? Because you just made an offer that's not fair. OK. This has been run in country after country thousands of times and lots and lots of published papers, hundreds of published papers. And let me tell you what they all say. If you make an offer under about $3, you're probably going to get turned down. That's what it comes down to. Offers over $3 tend to be accepted. Offers under $3 tend to get, get the, the reaction of spite. Somebody's going to make sure that you get, I don't care if I don't get 3 bucks. I just want to make sure you get nothing because you're unfair. You're a selfish person. Okay, now, really different in different countries. It turns out that the most generous country is Paraguay. I know you're the ambassador to Uruguay. Um, Ur uh, uh, Paraguay, it turns out people offer a little bit more than five bucks, which is a really weird finding. The most selfish country is Spain, where I lived and where my wife is from, right? And so I asked my wife about it. So what's the, what's the deal? And she said, that's just how we roll. <laughs> she said, <laughs> which maybe explains something about what's going on in the Spanish economy today. So, OK, um, now, what was the conclusion of this? What was the moral conclusion that economists took away from this experiment? It was fairness means sharing. If you have more and somebody else has less, it's fair if you share some of it. So therefore, redistribution from people who have more to people who have less is a fair thing to do. It might not be a smart thing to do, but it's a fair thing to do. That's how fairness is defined. And that, in point of fact, is how many politicians define it today. The rich need to pay their fair share. Why? Because they've got the money. It's not right for them to hold on to it when we have needs in this country. It's not fair because people have less. They should, in fairness, share more. OK, now, a friend of mine and a bunch of other researchers for this, at this matter, have noticed along the way, wait a second, something wrong with this experiment. The problem is that you just gave the first person 10 bucks when they came into the room. They didn't earn it. What happens if they earn it? So a friend of mine came up with an ingenious way of actually injecting earning into the experiment. What did he do? He was doing an experiment with undergraduate men. Okay, And he said, if you want the 10 bucks, you have to sing for it in front of all these other students. Right? Now, there's nothing more embarrassing to an undergraduate man than singing in front of a whole bunch of strangers. Right? I mean, it's mortifying. I'm kind of embarrassed to do it right now. I probably wouldn't do it. He made them sing, the bear went over the mountain. Right? The whole thing, if they wanted to get the 10 bucks. Some of them did, some of them didn't. The ones who did, they got the 10 bucks. OK, now, what happened in the experiment? Two things. Number one, the offers for the people who had earned the 10 bucks by embarrassing themselves went practically to zero, number one. Number two, the rejection rate went all the way to zero. What does this mean? If you earn it, the other person doesn't have a moral claim on it, and that other person agrees. That's what the experiments say. If you earn it, all the rules are off because the moral claim is no longer fairness on the basis of sharing. It's fairness on the basis of merit. It's fairness on the basis of earning it. The whole conversation in America today is not about redistribution. It's not even about fairness. It's about whether Americans have earned what they have. That's what we're arguing over. 
Every time President Obama or Mitt Romney or anybody else says, it's not fair. It's an argument about whether or not we earned it, and so therefore we should be able to keep it. The question is, what do Americans think? If I can tell you what Americans think about whether we earned it, I can tell you the right definition of fairness. Redistributive fairness or meritocratic fairness. So what do Americans think? Take the general social survey. I talked about that just a minute ago. All the way back to 1972, every two years, they've asked Americans, what do you think explains success in America? Hard work or lucky breaks? That question, all the way back to 1972, never has hard work scored less than 60%. Never has lucky breaks ever scored above 16%. Americans believe that we earn what we have in this country. Are they wrong? You decide. You decide. You can tell me in the q and I'm completely wrong if I even think that. I'm not making the claim. I'm all, I report on the public opinion data. But now expose it to a little bit of common sense. Some of you came here to this country via ancestors that were immigrants. I did. Why did they come here? Was it to get a fairer system of forced income redistribution? No. You can imagine a guy in Vietnam or something today saying, if only I could get to America, because there they have cash for clunkers. <laughs> no, no, that's absurd. It's not the way people think when they're trying to get to this country. There are no letters from my ancestors, at you know, my grandparents at Ellis Island saying, it sure is great to be in America for the welfare. They actually wanted to start a farm. They wanted to be rewarded for their hard work and merit for the first time in their lives. This is an important idea. This is the reason that Frank said he was grateful, even though he was poor, to be born in California and to be born in America. And I bet a lot of you are grateful for the same thing, and so am I. That's because we fundamentally understand that not everything is fair, that not everybody earns everything they have, but on balance, the meritocratic definition of fairness is the right one. And incidentally, when you ask that question straight out, what's the right definition of fairness? 89% of Americans choose merit over redistribution. Okay, now, then you gotta ask, what's the system that brings it about? What's the system that rewards merit and hard work systematically? What's the system that penalizes free riding and corruption and greed, if it's, if it's actually designed the right way? It's the free enterprise system. That's why we have to take care of it if we truly believe in the second definition of fairness, and we want to pass on the definition of fairness to new generations of Americans, and indeed share it as our blessing to people around the world. Now, I gotta to get to the poor before I stop and I turn it over to Kinch. Does free enterprise help poor people? I mean, come on, the little girl living in the car with her mother, do you really think free enterprise is gonna help her? Does free enterprise help poor people around the world, or does it only help the rich? <clears throat> I want you to consider a piece of data and uh, that data looks at the difference between 1970 and today. And I want to look at the percentage of the world's population that is in the worst poverty. The development economists, they define that arbitrarily as people living on a dollar a day or less. Okay? What has happened to the percentage of the world's population that lives on a dollar a day or less? The answer is, it's fallen by 80%. An 80% drop in the world's worst poverty. Now, you probably join me in believing and understanding that there's still a lot of poverty around the world, even here in America, and you may join me in feeling morally commanded to treat the least of these, our brothers and sisters, with particular respect and particular care. I am not making the claim that there's no poverty, but I am reporting the fact that the world's worst poverty since 1970, as a percentage of the world's population, has decreased by four-fifths. You gotta ask the question, what did that? You never read about it in the paper, but who did that? <laughs> was it the fabulous success of the United Nations? Was it the IMF or the World Bank? Was it the, the, the rise of central planning? Socialism? No, it wasn't. Whether or not those are good things is immaterial. It came from five things. Globalization, international trade, property rights, rule of law, and cross-border entrepreneurship. It was the explosion of American-style free enterprise around the world since 1970 that pulled literally billions of people out of poverty. There is somebody who's not burying her child tonight in sub-Saharan Africa because of the free enterprise system that's been spread around the world that was completely unknown to the world before 1970. There's somebody who's going to school today for the first time in the history of a Chinese village 
because of the American free enterprise system. Indeed, China, since 1980, has pulled 400 million of its citizens out of poverty. It was not because of the Maoist ideal. It was because of the explosion in trade, largely with the United States and other Western countries, that built that. Now, I know there's a lot wrong with the system. I know there's a lot wrong with China. I know there's a lot wrong with America. But you've got to face facts. If I believe that there's a moral imperative to pull hundreds of millions, billions of people out of poverty without even trying, how can I not pursue that system? I must do it as a good Samaritan. I must do it as a moral person. And I must try to find the system of earned success, of true fairness, that helps the vulnerable. And I have to gear that system in new and creative ways to make sure that we don't sacrifice the opportunities in this country so the little girl who lives in the car can get relief and can get opportunity, which is what I've dedicated my career to doing. And so has Frank. The free enterprise system is the only system that makes it possible. Now, I'm going to stop here because I want to know what Ken Hoekstra has to say about these remarks. But I'm simply going to close by saying many of you, like Frank, have pursued these ideals for a long time. Frank, in particular, his time, talent, and treasure toward the ideals of a free society and passing on the blessings of free, the American free enterprise system to more people, more people who are not born into these blessings. God bless you for doing that. And to all of you, my last word is thank you. Very much, Arthur. I also want to add my own personal th thanks to Ambassador Frank Baxter for his support of what I think is a really important program on the Berkeley campus. Um, I also, again, want to thank Arthur Brooks for his willingness to make this uh, eloquent uh, and impassioned uh, uh, moral case for free enterprise. Um, I uh, read the recent book, just came out this year, on uh, the, the Road to Freedom, uh, published in 2012. I recommend it as a, a gripping read. In particular, I admire the consistency of the principles uh, that Arthur there articulates. Uh, that consistency, I think, probably comes uh, at a certain cost for Arthur uh, in his, uh, as he goes about his business. Not least, he's as willing to blame Republicans as Democrats uh, for poor policy, um, and, uh, and does that uh, consistently throughout his book. And he's uh, also nearly as ready to blame corporate cronyism as big government for uh, uh, the difficulties uh, he diagnoses. Um, I also think that there's a lot to like about some of the, uh, some of the uh, recipes that he offers for Social Security, uh, for Medicare, for example, that they should be focusing more on uh, the task of uh, uh, targeting the fate of the poor rather than uh, uh, ensuring the comfort of the middle class. Um, he's got interesting proposals in, as well f uh, for things like immigration reform. He's against the asinine policy that we have that as soon as we offer a degree here at Berkeley or uh, whether that's an undergraduate or a graduate degree to an overseas, a, a student from overseas, we kick them promptly out of the country. Uh, he's willing to tackle fossil fuel subsidies, agricultural subsidies based on production, uh, and so forth. But most importantly, I uh, uh, commend Dr. Brooks for his argument that we should, uh, as he puts it in his book, work tirelessly for more equal opportunity for all. Dr. Brooks argues that government intervention in the economy can be warranted in a whole range of cases. Uh, he uh, talks about four uh, such uh, uh, types of cases. And that is addressing monopolies, information asymmetries, externalities, and the provision of public goods. Uh, unlike Arthur, I, I suspect that these cases rightly uh, get us to a very large public expenditure. We can talk more about that uh, uh, with you all. Dr. Brooks argues that uh, we have lost the proper road and that we've effectively become a kind of European uh, uh, social welfare state, um, and uh, that things are going uh, consistently in the wrong direction. 
Um, again, we can talk about this more uh, in the question and answer session. I think there are uh, lots of uh, complications uh, here, um, not least, as, as many know, uh, the public sector jobs uh, have, have uh, dramatically fallen in recent years um, as the private sector jobs have risen. Um, uh, it's even the case, of course, uh, because of the infusion of uh, uh, lots of uh, expenditure, lots of recent expenditure that we've uh, gone through a, a very fast uh, fall in the federal deficit over the last three years. But I, I want to focus instead on three more substantial areas because I think Arthur was right to uh, focus uh, his attention on uh, the, uh, the moral case for free enterprise. And there are three substantial areas where um, I, I remain for now unconvinced, and I want to invite Arthur to say a bit more about each of these three areas. First, I'd welcome a further discussion about opportunity. Uh, Arthur appears to acknowledge that the road to freedom is paved not just with hard work, but with a rough equality of opportunity. Arthur argues that the deck is not on balance stacked against the poor, and that there is sufficient mobility to allow him to claim that we, or rather that you, those of you who are not public employees, deserve the money you are paid. He argues that income equality does not undermine what he calls the opportunity society. There are many uh, uh, studies and statistics we could bring forward here, um, uh, but I think a, a number of them would uh, suggests that it remains the case that one of the most important choices that one can make to ameliorate one's future is to choose the right parents. Dr. Brooks rightly emphasizes the importance of mobility, um, and I heartily uh, uh, join uh, uh, him in that, uh, but I think it's clear that we need a lot more of it. A child, uh, this, just to look at the panel study of income dynamics that uh, Arthur uh, himself uh, pays close attention to in his book, if we look at the statistics there, we learn that a child born into the top 10% of America's wealth has a 30% chance of staying there. A child born into the bottom 10% has a 32% chance of staying there. Of course, perfect equality of opportunity would mean that each would have only a 10% chance, just as high as the chance that the child would grow up to be in the 10% at the opposite extreme. But the chances that someone from the bottom 10% will ever reach the top 10% is 1.3%. Even most people who identify themselves as egalitarians do not think that we should strive for equality of outcomes, which is sometimes Arthur's target. Um, most instead, of course, think that we should strive for greater equality of opportunities. And Arthur seems to agree that we should strive for that. In his recent book, he quotes Abraham Lincoln uh, saying the following, so while we do not propose any war upon capital, we do wish to allow the humblest man an equal chance to get rich with everybody else. I think the problem is still that we're a far cry from allowing such an equal chance. Second, I'd like to uh, hear Dr. Brooks say more about fairness. Um, uh, no one, even those who are uh, manifestly unfair, wish to denounce fairness. Uh, so this provides, at least in principle, an easy point, a uh, uh, starting point for agreement. Um, but I'll just raise uh, uh, two uh, quick case, cases. Um, the first, uh, which uh, as an economist he'll uh, know more about than I, uh, is about the, the question about uh, what's happened to uh, wages as the economy has, has uh, overall boomed in recent decades. Uh, wages have been essentially stagnant in real terms since the early 70s during a period when worker productivity has markedly increased and the economy has grown considerably. And we have to ask ourselves, is that fair? Is it fair that growth in productivity and profits should go almost exclusively to the owners? A second kind of case that I'd uh, welcome uh, more discussion about is what, it, what Arthur wants to say about inherited uh, wealth. Uh, is it fair that those who have not earned their fortunes are able to keep them and largely pass them on to their heirs. Arthur expresses concern very eloquently about what he calls learned helplessness. 
but I wonder whether this doesn't teach a powerful lesson in helplessness and undercut the idea of earned success. To earn your success is presumably an individual matter, um, and whereas it would seem that uh, inherited wealth will be therefore necessarily unearned. And finally, I'd, I'd like to hear Arthur speak more about the role of politics. Um, I'll raise one question based on the idea that our political system uh, may be unfair, and another question uh, based on the assumption that our political system is basically fair. First, one of the arguments for there being something wrong with a widening wealth gap in the country is that disparity of wealth may lead to disparity of political influence. Um, and this is something I don't think Arthur uh, speaks about very, very much in, in uh, what, he, what he said today or in his recent book. And uh, I'd like to draw him out on that. If the comparative wealth of the wealthiest is in part a result of politics, that is the result of the wealthiest having more control over relevant government policy, it seems we have a problem even in uh, Arthur's own terms. Do we have or can there ever be an adequate firebreak uh, between greater wealth and greater political power and influence, and indeed is it desirable uh, to have one, uh, uh, according to Arthur. If free enterprise results in political inequality, then there is an unanswered question about whether such enterprise, enterprise undermines democratic values unless properly reined in. Finally, let me just turn uh, uh, to a question on the assumption that the system is basically fair. Arthur argues uh, that to give what one person has earned to another person is unfair if it's coerced. But let's pause for a moment to think about where the coercion comes from. Arthur uh, admits in his uh, recent book that people aren't going to be willing to cough up the $2,500 that the average American has to contribute to pay for our defense bill if you simply go door to door to ask for it. We are coerced to provide that public good. Um, but that's fairly unproblematic as we are more or less coerced by ourselves. If the political process works as it should, there's a considerable uh, uh, if, but if it works as it should, our representatives determine what we should be required to contribute. Our usual view of this matter is that decisions, decisions that are reached in this way are legitimately coercible, whether or not they are redistributive, so long as they do not violate uh, basic uh, fundamental rights. Dr. Brooks sees this when criticizing uh, in his book the anti-war activist who wants to withhold the amount that would go to military spending. But it also applies to the amount that our government votes should go to any re redistributive measures, it seems to me. Such coercion would seem to be basically fair insofar as it's backing up a fair political process. Um, I'm sure I just had these few minutes, but I'm sure that many of you will have questions for Dr. Brooks, but these are the three I see as particularly central. First, having to do with opportunity. Second, and relatedly, having to do with fairness. And finally, having to do with the role of politics. It only remains me for me to thank Arthur for his eloquent remarks and uh, invite him to reply if he should so wish. Well, those are the right questions. Uh, those are exactly the questions that occur to me. Uh, that those are the, the conundrums that you're left with in, in, in a necessarily incomplete thesis. And some that I've thought about subsequently to the publication of the book, in no small part because I've talked about the book a lot since the beginning of the summer, and I've, I've been presented with thoughtful questions like this. And so I have an opportunity to answer them poorly, and then I hope answer them a little bit better. Um, and so let's start with opportunity. And this is something that I believe I've repudiated since the publication of this book. I asserted in the book, in the third chapter, I think, that equality of opportunity has not markedly changed in America and is very high compared to other countries. Um, I think that's not true. I think that's not true, it, because based on data that I've been looking at since the beginning of the summer, new data that are going into a new book project uh, about how to make a free enterprise system that is indeed more compassionate 
uh, toward the, the, the most vulnerable members of society. And then let me tell you basically what I found. I found that the opportunity to, or the mobility, and this gets into the second question a little bit as well, to, from, to go from the bottom quintile to the middle quintile or above is lower than it was. And it's lower than it has been in, in, a, in a good deal of time, and it's lower than it is indeed in Europe today. Now, there's a little sleight of hand there. It turns out that the, the, the income distribution, which is more narrow in Europe, makes it easier to go from quintile to quintile because it's only a few bucks apart when you have a, a society that doesn't have dramatic inequality. But be that as it may, it's still a shocking fact. If mobility is higher in Europe than it is in America, something's pretty wrong, as far as I'm concerned, given my values. Second fact, and this is, I think, even more alarming as, as bears on opportunity. One of the things that's the silver lining for recessions and depressions in the United States for time, from time immemorial is that when people in the bottom quintile of the income distribution face long-term unemployment, typically you will see after about nine months of persistent unemployment, upwards of 10% starting their own businesses. And this is the reason that uh, an economy, an entrepreneurial economy, can rise sort of like a phoenix from the ashes, starting from the bottom up. It doesn't happen in other countries. It doesn't happen in Europe. It doesn't happen in industrializing nations. It happens in America that when the, their back is against the wall, poor people start landscaping businesses. Poor people start barber shops because they can't get any other job. It's an amazing phenomenon. It's actually really inspirational. But since 2007, the percentage of people in that circumstance and in that income quintile and those circumstances are starting their own businesses has fallen from 11% to 4%. We've cut it by two thirds. Something's happened in this country. The opportunity society is attenuated. Now, if you're a conservative free market scholar, you might say, well, the problem is because we're giving them 99 weeks of unemployment, man. I mean, people follow incentives. But it's more, it's more to it than that. The data suggests there's more to it than that. There are barriers to people being entrepreneurs. There are systematic barriers. And so I'm asking myself in my new work, what are those barriers? And so I, I, I don't support a lot of the things that I think were actually in evidence in the data before, but not today. The question is this, what are the barriers and what do we do? Well, in a nutshell, it's this. There are three barriers to entrepreneurship for people in the bottom 20% of the income distribution today. Number one, schools that serve adults, not kids. That's an applause line sometimes. So um, I wasn't fishing for it, Frank. The, uh, number two, entrepreneurship and business starting is getting objectively harder because of professional and licensing requirements, onerous regulation, and uncertain taxation. Fact, especially for the people in the bottom 20% of the income distribution. And number three, we're not making any systematic attempt to talk about the cultural barriers to the opportunity society that are systematically overrepresented in the bottom 20%. So let's take, talk about those just very quickly in turn. Schools, I mean, look, we know the story. We know the story about the fact that you come to Washington, D.C., you'll see more spending per kid than any other district in the United States and some of the worst outcomes for poor kids. Look, my kids are not affected. Your kids are not affected. Who's affected? Poor kids are affected by bad schools that focus on bureaucracy, teachers unions, and other adult groups as the main constituencies. Now, I'm not trying to set the place on fire. I, I simply uh, submit that for your consideration. Two, entrepreneurship, what's going on? The truth is that the regulatory barriers, the requirements actually to be a legal entrepreneur are insurmountable for a population that at least half of which does not have systematic access even to the internet. I actually, did, in, in, in preparation for the book that I'm about to write, I tried to figure out what it would take to start a barber shop in Maryland where I live. Maryland's kind of like California except not as broke, right? So uh, what do you have to do to start a barber shop in Maryland? Well, I spent two hours on the internet and I still had the, had the slightest idea what I needed to do. Just now, okay, I have a PhD, so I can't do anything practical. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, stipulate to that. But in point of fact, if it's hard for me to figure out what's going on to start a small business, what's it going to be for the guy who wants to start a landscape business, who morally shouldn't have to have anything but a lawnmower? It's a real problem. And the last is the real tyranny of the 1%. I recommend to your interest the work of my colleague, uh, AEI scholar Charles Murray. 
Charles Murray wrote a big bestseller uh, this spring called Coming Apart that talks about the cultural differences between the bottom 20% and the top 5%. The real tyranny of the rich in this country, the real 1% that we need to occupy and break down is our inability to talk about the fact that our, our cultural norms that are the essence of earned success, that are the essence of happiness in our lives, the institutions like faith, family, community, and vocational work, we don't talk about those things and try to inculcate those values in the bottom 20% of the income distribution. Unless we're willing to talk about the cultural institutions that make us happy and successful, we're not sharing our secret, and they can't crack the code. That's the thesis of my colleague, Charles Murray. I recommend it to you, and you'll decide for yourself. That's the problem with the Opportunity Society. That's the problem that we face today. And if we want a serious moral agenda, a militant pro-poor agenda, it better talk about education, entrepreneurship, and culture. Now, that talked about a little bit about, uh, about fairness, too. Prompt me on the next one. Uh, so opportunity, uh, uh, fairness, and uh, what was the third one? <laughs> Thank you, politics. So the political system, of course, is hugely problematic. Hugely problematic because in point of fact, everybody knows that if you're rich, just like if you're educated, just like if you're smart, just like if you're funny and good looking, you have more access to the tools of communication. and People are more likely to be influenced by you. You're more likely to be in the place where people understand what you have to say, and they're more likely to be swayed by your arguments. Everybody knows this. You have to be stupid not to think that that's the case. The question is, how do you even that out? Is the way to do that to equalize incomes? Is the way to do that to get more socialism? Well, how many of you have spent time in actual socialist countries? Is there more equality? Is there actually more political equality? In these countries, is there, more, is there better access to people who are disenfranchised in these particular places? My experience is that that's not the case. My experience is that venality and greed and social inequality are exacerbated in these places. We don't have a perfect system. We don't have perfect access, and we don't have per po perfect political equality. But attenuating the free enterprise system and getting more socialism, I dare say, would take us in exactly, and this is an empirical assertion, in exactly the wrong direction. We need better, uh, we need better solutions than simply changing our economic system. So I, I wasn't uh, propounding socialism, but, in, but I, I let, let, me, let me just, let me just uh, push you on the, the second possibility, which is the, the question of whether, uh, whether it is genuinely unfair to coerce people to uh, uh, give up their income if it is the result, if that such a decision is the result of a fair political process? So my, my belief is that redistribution is necessary, but it's not fair. It's OK that we do things that are not fair. It's OK. We do these things that are not fair all the time. I have children. I'm doing unfair things constantly. You know, I'm giving something to one, but not to the other. It's constantly the case. I redistribute willy-nilly. I'm arbitrary and capricious as a father. It, it, I do these things not it, in spite of the fact that they're unfair, because I have other objectives. We need redistribution because we have to have a functioning state. A functioning state necessarily requires the redistribution of resources. We have uh, norms such as, I want a functioning social safety net that's reliable for the poor, paid for by the government. That's what I want. It's not super popular in the conservative movement, I can tell you. But that's what I think is right. I think it's decent. I think we can afford it. And a lot of economists like Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman agree with me on that. That doesn't make it fair. It just makes it smart and just and moral for other reasons. It's OK to do things that are not necessarily fair. It's OK to accept things that are not necessarily fair. The mistake is saying that unfair things are fair, because that actually puts us in a moral predicament that we can't escape from, and it's a slippery slope toward treating vast groups of people systematically unfairly, and that leads us to a worse society. If we're making a sacrifice, we should make it on purpose. Thanks very much. I think both of you will have a chance to comment, and I'm sure that those remarks will be uh, echoed and uh, have provoked good questions, so people have been patient. I want to welcome our Executive Vice Chancellor, George Breslar, here from another Obligation. Thank you, George, for coming. And uh, let me uh, let me take a, a few questions. Okay.
Well, here is here's a here's a sort of policy oriented question I think provoked by Kinch's point about inheritance. Is why not have a hundred percent estate tax to fund public works contracts for private contractors and other free enterprise initiatives? Or or so. So it's essentially a question about, you know, what, what would be wrong? I mean, why oppose on the grounds that I suppose right. that inheritance is not earned, but right. just luck, which we say we don't want. Right. And so it says, why not, well, why not have 100% estate tax sure. and then use it to fund public work sure. contracts for private contractors? So would you, you know, and other free enterprise initiatives? It's a good question. I didn't answer that because you asked the same question. It's a smart question. Um, learned helplessness, and, and I've looked at the data on this. People who inherit learn helplessness, just like people who get lottery winnings learn helplessness, just like people who get welfare learn helplessness. The truth is, it doesn't matter what social class you're from. If you didn't earn it, it's a curse. Interesting. I mean, the lottery, the lottery literature is just mind-blowing, as a matter of fact. You know, what happens... Six months after you win the lottery, you're permanently unhappier than the day you permanently unhappier than the day you won. And, and it's very interesting. You find that and there's a big database from the University of Michigan on, on major Powerball lottery winners. People win 30 million or more at once. They're generally poor. They go to 30 million or above. It's a lot of money. What happens? Six months later, they don't enjoy their lives. They don't enjoy playing sports. They don't enjoy hanging out with their families. They don't enjoy going shopping. They don't enjoy watching television. It's as if all the little experiences in their lives have lost their meaning, and they don't enjoy spending the money. Life is worse. If you play the lottery, the best thing that can happen to you is that you don't win. And that's an empirical fact. So, so what does this mean in the case of people who inherit money? It is true that it's not helpful to you to... Now, I, ha, I don't have data that show that people, after they inherit money, they're more miserable. I just have data that show that when people inherit money, it does nothing to enhance the satisfaction in their lives. Nothing at all. Okay, so why not take it all away? If they're learning helplessness, why not do that? And the answer is this. There's a cost to doing that. Not to the heir, but to the person who's bequeathing the money. If you believe in a free society that people should dispose of their income as they see fit and treat them fairly, and they want to dispose of their income in a particular way, my belief is we need to respect that. There is a cost to living in a society where we take it all away as soon as you die, even though you earned it justly and honestly. When I work, I work with a lot of people with, of, because I, philanthropy was my primary area of research as an academic. I worked with a lot of people with very high net worth about this issue. They say, well, what do we do? And here's the solution. There's a solution. Here's what you do. You pay for their education, and you dedicate the rest of your life to, together as a family, giving away every penny of it, and don't give them one dime that they didn't earn beyond improving their opportunities. That's actually the solution for the best life. But then again, you don't want to enforce that at the government level because you're stripping them of their freedom. This is a case of balance, of, of learned helplessness versus the freedom of the person leaving the bequest. OK, here is a question. This is, what, is the, what, what is the role of society in the concept of earned success? How much of any individual success is earned purely on their own merit? And how much is due to the work or the effect of others? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and there's a lot of research that is, comes to entirely contrary conclusions on this. There's just simply no consensus on the role of society. One thing that we do know absolutely for sure is that the economic system makes a big difference. If you want people to earn their success, they need free enterprise. They simply do. If you want them to learn helplessness, I recommend social democracy. And I know this because I've compared the European social democracies with the United States. I've done it sit side by side systematically. This is the best quasi-experimental approach we could possibly take in modern times. And, and that's why the system matters a lot. And the system is a big part of society. Do you want to weigh in on this? What's your thinking on this? Well, I, I'm pretty Or did you write that question? No, I did not. <laughs> uh, but I'm pretty sympathetic uh, to it. And it's one of the things that um, I, I, I think one of the things that it gets to is an assumption of individualism in your, the way you've presented your ideas, mm -hmm. not just individualism as a value, that is, the individual as a bearer of values, but in some sense, it gets to the question of how 
how independent a, 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 any given individual actor is. Don't they necessarily depend on uh, all sorts of things that they haven't paid for and indeed that their parents haven't paid for. Sure, absolutely. And that's incidentally part of the reason that I spoke at a little bit of length about culture, the importance of a healthy culture. Um, Adam Smith knew this. You gotta have a healthy culture before you can have a functioning free enterprise system. He wrote The, the Wealth of Nations in 1776. 17 years earlier in 1759, I'm on your turf now a little bit, um, in 1759, he published the Theory of Moral Sentiments, which basically said that the precursor to a healthy functioning market economy is a series of well-ordered moral sentiments at the societal level. If we don't have well-ordered morals, if we don't understand how a society is supposed to work, if we're not generous people that can work well with each other, then we're simply not going to be able to handle capitalism. I mean, that's the punchline of the corpus of Adam Smith's work. We have a tendency to forget that. Conservatives always forget that. They forget the theory of moral sentiments. They go right to the, the they go right to the, uh, the, the the capitalism part. That stuff sounds good, but the truth of the matter is, you have to have a good society, and a good society has a healthy, functioning moral culture. And what that means is in all of our hearts, and that's just as important as the market signals I'm talking about here tonight. Here's a question that I think was stimulated by your opening comments about uh, the love, you know, the level of uh, taxation when AEI started and the trajectory that uh, government uh, has been on. So in your opinion then, what would be the moral, the quote, moral unquote level for a government to draw from uh, the free enterprise system? In other words, I suppose, if you're gonna have a, you know, what would be your, your you know, your, your fair level of taxation? Less. <laughs> uh, now, okay, I gotta do better than that. Um, the truth is there's no moral arithmetic here on this. Uh, you go to Sweden, it's a great country. You know, people are actually pretty happy. People like their trains and their really great public services and they have a super high tax rate and the government is uh, right now vacuuming up about 50% of Swedish GDP. Now, their corporate tax rate is a th about half of what the American corporate tax rate is so they can remain competitive and, and be more productive and bring American businesses from California, which is ac actually their objective in doing that. But they've made a, mo they've made a moral contract that, that what they want to do, what they, gives them what they feel is the best society is that. Every society gets to decide is the point. My view is that we're above the point that we're actually comfortable with as a society. The conventional wisdom is allowing us to go down this road but I think that we're actually morally uncomfortable with this society because it's coming into a, a, a clash with other values that we hold uh, in the main as Americans. Now, how come? Part of it is because most of the entrepreneurs in Sweden ended up in St. Paul, Minnesota. The truth of the matter is, as an immigrant-based society, we have an entrepreneurial ethos that's not generally shared by other countries. That's not a xenophobic or ethnocentric thing to say. The truth of the matter is that there are good studies that show that the entrepreneurial, uh, the entrepreneurial ethos is a genetic, is in no small part, genetic phenomenon. That has to do with the way that people take risk. It has to do with the way that people are comfortable um, in areas where they haven't performed or, or in, been involved in economic activity. And, and that's something that systematically will vary, maybe a mutation in European countries, but when you crowd these people as immigrants in, in America, which is part of the reason that I have very strong views on, on, on open immigration laws, because I think it's the vitality of our country to keep this. But this comes into a clash, boom, between us and other countries. That's why I think less is the right direction so that we can become the country that I believe that we still want to be. There are a lot of interesting questions here. I'm going to try and choose some that vary, that, that are varied, but here, here is one. Uh, does, does, a, does, eco, does a society with econo, with, does a society which values liberty allow, quote, fair trade, unquote, with autocratic regimes such as communist dictatorships, such as China, or with, you know, uh, fascist regimes. Is this kind of economic trade moral? In what sense is this, you know, a product of true liberty? True. Um, this is a huge controversy inside my own institution. Okay. So 
when we talk about China, for example, well, there are two camps, trade more and trade less. <laughs> Obviously, they can't coexist in peaceful harmony. Somebody's got to be right. Why is there a conflict on this? One side says that trade with regimes that are not perfectly democratic, or they're not even very democratic at all, will push them toward greater democracy because there will be more prosperity, there will be more of a middle class, people will start to exert their need for, for political freedom just as they've enjoyed economic freedom. That's a theory. The other side says, show me the data. There's no evidence of that. Basically, all you're doing is you're getting richer and richer autocratic regimes. And that's not right, because people deserve and need political freedom. Still a third group that we typically see says, I don't know which is the right way to go. But I do think that people starving because we haven't traded with them, because they haven't experienced the fruits of free enterprise, is always and everywhere a bad thing. That I know for sure. I'm the third. I'm in the third group. I don't know whether or not there's an inevitability about people striving for political freedom because they've experienced economic freedom. I don't know if that's true at all. But even if it isn't true, I think that people starving because we're blockading their country or imposing economic sanctions is a bad way to go. I think that people will experience some kind of freedom, more prosperity, uh, and a better life. And I think that in and of itself is a pretty good goal. This goes to your research, I think, in philanthropy. It says, one of the byproducts of free enterprise seems to be the accumulation of large fortunes that end up in private grant-making foundations. Uh, university likes that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> What's not to like? <laughs> uh, uh, but here's the kicker. Uh, that are exempt from taxation and are accountable to no one other than the trustees and that continue in perpetuity. Is this a good system? Yeah, it's, um, Tocqueville talked about this in 1835, sort of. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong on this one, because this, I'm, 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 I'm treading in your turf a lot more uh, here. So Thomas Jefferson, when he was ambassador to France, was asked, give, an exa give the, the, your definition of an American. Maybe it's apocryphal. He said, an American is a man who moves west the first day he hears the sound of his neighbor's axe. Right? OK. Good enough. I mean, that's basically what Tocqueville said. I mean, Tocqueville said the vast ungovernable frontier of the United States requires what we would today call mediating institutions, nonprofit organizations, community action, volunteerism, where in France you find a man of rank, where in England you find a man of government. In, in the United States you find a voluntary association that are engaged in all sorts of activities. That's the most famous quote from Democracy in America by Tocqueville in 1835. The outgrowth of that is the nonprofit sector has all sorts of funding mechanisms that are, that are, in fact, largely outside of the realm of government. Who thinks that the government would somehow police this in some equitable, smart, and economically uh, efficient way? If, if you believe these things, uh, then you haven't been to the countries where there is no voluntary giving, no voluntary service, no philanthropy, and everything is ultimately provided by the government because the government has crowded virtually everything else out. We have sacrifices, obviously. They're going to be abuses. Uh, a lack of uh, regulation in one sphere will invite abuse because there are incentives to do so. But at what price do we regulate these things? Uh, that's what I contemplate when I look at the nonprofit sector. The, when I look at the nonprofit sector in the, in, the, in the foundation world, I see abuses, but I see great good that's going on that in the face of strong, much, much stronger regulation, I fear that we would, we would sacrifice those things. And I'm content, um, or at least not horribly discontent, to see the system that we currently have. Can you? It, well, and the, just in the case of, I'm just curious about the distinction. I, I, I think I understood why there was one. But in the case of a philanthropical foundation, say, uh, we allow for a tax break, we allow for them to be tax exempt because they're serving a public good. Um, r regardless of the, whether it's a redistributive public right. good or, or what have Whatever. you. Whatever. Right. Um, but in, in, in that case, we're, we're, we're deploying taxation in a particular way for a public end. But you're, 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 you seem content with that, but not content with deploying taxation where you're getting money via taxation for, for a similar kind of public end. 
So, well, right. <laughs> the way to solve that is by getting rid of the tax deductibility of contributions and letting right. people simply do the charity the way that they see fit. But that's not the way the system was set up in the beginning. In the United States, the, the government uh, recognized that it's a, basically a partnership between the government and the people for the provision of public goods. And so therefore, simply not taxing income that's given toward public good activity is designed today in what we call Section 501 of the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, is defined in those particular activities, simply isn't taxed because it's designated by the donors themselves to these public goods. Citizen, private citizens get to do what only governments can do in other countries. That's, that's the basic idea. That was, that was how it was designed in 1917, four years after the, 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 the initiation of the income tax. I mean, it's as old, practically as old as the income tax itself. We're adjudicating whether or not that's a good idea in America today. And incidentally, private foundations have a ton of regulation. They have a ton of oversight that we see. A private foundation can't simply bring in a vast fortune and sit on it. You have to give away 5% of your total assets every single year. That's, that's the law, or you'll lose your tax exempt designation. You're also required to uh, uh, act according to established public policy, not even the law. Established public policy. If something is established as the, the public policy of the land, uh, nonprofit organizations are required to act according to those things. So there is a good deal of oversight right now. I don't want to make it sound like it truly is the wild, wild west. Okay. I'm going to try and deal with these last three questions because you've been working really hard and uh, we have to uh, allow you to imbibe some of the pleasures of California mm -hmm. society here. What um, does he have in store? Uh, <laughs> uh, but here's a question which I think you commented on a little bit, but maybe you can return to. Is the concept of learned helplessness, help, is the concept or is the acquisition, is learned helplessness reversible once it becomes sort of inculcated into the culture or into the individual as it currently seems to be? I don't know. Um, I wish I could say, yeah, absolutely. It's just a question of exposing people to a system of earned success, and they'll just bite into the apple, and everything will be beautiful again. But I don't know. I mean, the truth is, I mean, I lived in Spain for a long time. This is a society that's deeply, deeply in the grips of learned helplessness. 26% of the adult population is out of work. 52% of young adults seeking work can't find it. 46% of adults over 18, but under 35, st under 35, still live with their parents. Imagine, 46, I shoot myself. 46, 46, sorry, mom. 46%. I mean, this is a society that largely has, in, in my view, become uh, um, uh, wards of the state, L learned helplessness. This is the, the uh, central organizing feature of, of Spanish public, uh, public policy and, and even culture. Um, will, can it be reversed? I don't know. When I go to Spain and I talk to people, I, I talk to my in-laws. I, I, it's very depressing. Uh, but the, the truth of the matter is there is no excuse to not try because it's, I think it's a moral imperative to allow more people to earn the success. Okay, here. Uh, the moral case for free enterprise uh, you've made. Let me see if I can read this. Okay, the moral case for free enterprise has been made by insisting that it aids in the realization of earned success, which you've shown to be independent of gross income. However, the data you've cited has focused on the link between free enterprise and economic growth. What exactly is the relationship between earned success and growth, and why should we think that a free enterprise system is the only or best way of increasing earned success? So earned success in the economic sphere basically means that you, earn, you're, you define your, or, or denominate your success in terms of your economic output. And it, it's a simple question because in point of fact, we have ample data that show that the free enterprise system, when, it's, when, it's, when people uh, behave properly, either because of moral norms or because of adequate regulation, uh, the free enterprise system allows people to pursue their economic success better than any other system and more than in any other system. That, that's a, almost the most established question in economics. What is the system that allows, that creates the, the greatest 
pecuniary fortunes of all of the systems? And the answer is market-based capitalism. Um, and, and the reason has to do with the fact that the incentives are aligned for, uh, through pr the, the institutions of private property and the maximization of profit for people to behave in such a way that they can, in fact, do so. That's obvious enough that it's not even interesting enough to be wrong. It's boring. The really interesting thing is once we get to a society where we have, most of us have adequate and adequate um, economic corpus, what can we do to improve the quality of our lives? And that's earned success outside of the profit-making sphere. That's the satisfaction that we feel in our lives from creating something, the creating value that isn't necessarily denominated in dollars. It might be denominated in dollars, but here's another interesting fact. When you look at the entrepreneurial orientation of people, you find that people who are qualitatively least, uh, least materialistic, those tend to be commercial entrepreneurs themselves. Uh, and, and this is the, the relationship that people have to money itself when they're involved in the value-making process as entrepreneurs changes. And that's a, a very interesting literature that is worth looking at. Uh, the bottom line is earned success is most interesting outside in a, in a rich country like the United States is most interesting where we pursue what we believe to be the source of our true value. And uh, when we can do that is only when we have a system that allows us adequate support a system in which we can have a government with an adequate safety net, a system in which we can go to a university that's paid for largely on the basis of philanthropy, that's acquired from vast fortunes made by mostly by entrepreneurs so that the rest of us can do things like we're doing right now, which is sitting here thinking about morality because somebody like Frank Baxter worked at an investment bank. And that's an extraordinary miracle. Well, I'm going to make the last question from a political science point of view, and this is also, I think, a version of Kinch's question, so maybe you both want to come to him. So in a quote, there's lots of quotes in actually these questions, quotation marks. In a quote, free, unquote, libertarian society with, lo with much less regulation, how are we to prevent private aggregations of power, e.g. corporations, from seizing, from, I guess, from dominating power in the society. So what would be a kind of, you know, in a, yeah. We've never succeeded in doing that. So. And in fact, the biggest problem we have in America today, outside of statism, is the illegitimate spouse of statism, which is crony capitalism. That is the accumulation of power by illegitimate means through favor grabbing and uh, political insiderism of corporations, of unions, of uh, entire sectors and powerful individuals having nothing to do with creating value, having nothing to do with creating value in the lives of others, and having everything to do with the accumulation of power and using it in ill-gotten ways. Um, I, have, I plead, if anybody sees me as, as uh, saying that the free enterprise system will always uh, spread power adequately and fairly around society, um, I tell you that I have not made that claim and I wouldn't. And I think we all need to be a lot more militant about cronyism in our society if we want a true free society. Kinch? Could I just uh, take the opportunity? You, you've, you've baited the audience, because we're all at the University of California, you, with your, your previous remarks, saying that you know, as long as a university is primarily funded by uh, philanthropy, then uh, you know, it looks like a legitimate and uh, a wonderful enterprise. Um, sitting in a state university, which we are, admittedly, we're sitting here in, in part because of, uh, of, of Frank Baxter's wonderful generosity and uh, also uh, the generosity of many others, but also because of the, the taxpayers of California. Mm -hmm. And I just want, want to go ahead and press you on, on that role, because you do allow for intervention in markets where public goods are provided. Sure. And uh, I just wonder why, uh, why you uh, think that the university is necessarily, necessarily has to be primarily privately funded uh, rather than it, it depending on what kind of public good is being provided by that university. Yeah, I'd say, I, I don't believe that necessarily a, pri a university has to be privately philanthropically funded. I think there are a lot of ways to do it. Uh, and I think that actually we have a wonderful system in the United States, which is one of the reasons that we have the best university system in the world. 
um, on balance. Um, among, I mean, we have 4,000 colleges and universities in America, and a lot of them are terrible. But we also have great ones, uh, you know, top universities like the one where we are today, uh, as a result of the of the mixing of the, the provision of public goods through taxpayer money and, and the pr private provision of public goods through philanthropy. I think there are a lot of ways to do it, and I'm not going to make the claim that there's no public good here or there's any reason that we shouldn't fund these through the public fisc. Well, on that reassuring note for those of us, <laughs> I, on that reassuring note for those of us who are dependent on it, the state, I want to just thank both of you very much. It's been a great, great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, thanks very much. I appreciate it. It's great to be here.